Hello, and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Brain Game, a brain training game for your brain. Does your brain feel like it's down a drain? Do you wish it weren't so plain? Then get on the brain train and play Brain Game, a brain training game for your brain. It's such a shame when thinking feels like a pain. Take off take of the reins of the train your brain with our game. You'll no longer be the same, and you can be vain about your brain. Be a dame and reign over your friends with your brain uh, when you've slain them in the competition mode. Uh, or you can feign uh, that you're the same plane by detaining your results from the, the public. So stop being insane, don't refrain, and come obtain brain game. You'll be more obeying, less inane, more off the chain. So pop the champagne and toast brain game. I do proclaim that you won't be the same because your brain won't wane with brain game. stop to ponder what it means to be a human, or what is human being? We may look to certain cognitive abilities from memory or language to the self, maybe even personality. There seems to be a number of unique human abilities. In my own research on memory and language, I'm always amazed uh, by how the line for what qualifies as something like autobiographical memory or the ability to produce language changes as we observe animals like scrub jays that are able to show Uh, knowledge of what, when, and where, uh, or when bonobos are able to learn hundreds of lexigrams, and how scientists kind of move the definition of uh, what autobiographical memory is or what language is around as these animals seem to show kind of former definitions of of those abilities. Uh, So the fundamental aspects of human thought and cognition have been pondered and explored since antiquity. Beginning with philosophers and more recently neuroscientists, researchers have been probing the mind and now the brain for answers. Today I speak with Calvin Trisolini about humanness and what it means to be. Thank you for coming in. I'm with Calvin Trisolini. We're talking about my favorite topic, memory, learning, and the brain. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you. And can you tell me about how you were getting, got interested in learning in the brain? Yeah, um, I am a philosophy major, um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about the brain. I'm taking a philosophy of mind class right now, um, and I've taken a lot of classes about knowledge and learning and the mind, um, and so I wanted to get a more detail-oriented scientific approach um, to the brain and learn a little bit more about how it actually works mm-hmm. and yes. how things function. I'm going to challenge you here. What are philosophers saying about learning and knowledge? Yeah, it's really interesting. Well, I mean, it's cool because I think since, like, early modern, like, or, or not even modern philosophy, like, early philosophy, like Plato, Aristotle, mm-hmm. um, people have been talking about, about this stuff, and interestingly, I think it, it hasn't changed that much, like, what people talk about, um, I think it's cool that we can talk and develop new ideas, um, and it's really interesting that... 2,000 years ago, we still had the same ideas that we do now, yeah. and I think people don't understand that, that philosophers like, accept scientific findings and like mm-hmm. understand them, um, but that doesn't change the, the way we, we think about, about the issues that are more uh, hand-wavy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, in your research in neuroscience, uh, mm-hmm. what have been some of the more interesting findings that you've found so far? Well, I've been looking at, um, about, again, like, the mind and how, like, what makes the human mind unique, Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I've been looking at a lot is self-awareness, um, like, a a person's ability to recognize and, like, and, like, metacognition. Yeah. Um, and kind of the limits of, of... that what that like how we can define self self knowledge um, and whether other rational animals have that ability. Yeah, uh, have you seen some of the tests for uh, testing self awareness in animals? Um, yeah, I, I actually I looked at some some stuff that were that was like mostly problem solving type, okay. type things, um, and it's also a really interesting thing that I've learned is is that monkeys there are certain apes that that imitate a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but interestingly, humans are the only animal that um, just 
naturally without training will learn language. Yeah. Which is fascinating to me. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh, described as uh, like magical in terms of yeah. how we can learn language. It's unbelievable. A any human baby, if you put them in an environment where they're around any language, they can learn that language mm -hmm. by themselves without prompting. Yeah. Um, and that's not the case for any other animal, which yeah. is wild. Yeah, and staying in the self-awareness task, uh, so we, uh, s some of the parts of the brain that are involved in like self-awareness and like what is the self are, are the same ones that uh, are in involved with the memory. Uh, so, right, if I can't uh, like form this like memory of my past, like how can I right. like form this identity or uh, this self-identity? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so there's, uh, there was this person that had that part of the brain uh, destroyed uh, and they did some of these self-identity tests. One of them being uh, uh, putting a red dot on uh, their forehead and then showing, uh, like having them look into a mirror. And uh, the self-awareness task was to be able to like look and see, recognize who you are in the mirror and remove the um, red dot from their forehead. Yeah. And so uh, they've done that with apes as well, but there's uh, some uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and some of those other kind of higher apes yeah. uh, where you put it on, a red dot on their forehead, put, show them a mirror and they'll remove the, the red dot. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, yeah, memory is, is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. um, being able to um, like humans can't have this ability to take uh, like first personal memory yeah. um, and equate it to present and future conceptions of, of the self, which is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and sticking in uh, learning, what, what are some other kind of like really confusing aspects of your research? Um, let's see. Um, yeah, imitation was one thing I mentioned that um, we um, humans imitate each other in a different way than other animals, so like that certain apes can imitate like a task so you can if you have to you know use, use a, a tool to yeah. reach into a thing they can figure out how to do that but humans are really good at imitating like specific techniques of that other humans do just like picking up on little things that like if like the way you turn a doorknob like a monkey can learn like oh in order to get through the store I have to like turn the doorknob and they'll figure out a way to do that mm -hmm. But a human can learn, like, oh, I like move my hand in this specific way to yeah. turn that doorknob. So uh, that was an interesting part of imitation that humans are really good at, and like learning how to, like, how to do things, not just what to do. Yeah, I, and uh, to fit in in different ways, uh, and yeah. like how quickly you can pick that up. Absolutely, yeah. We we do an incredible job of that. Yeah, it's fascinating. In, in particular, s different social s uh, scenarios. I'm always amazed when I go into a new thing. I the most memorable one to me was when I was in high school and I got invited to a yacht club party, which I w has <laughs> growing up had not been <laughs> invited to a lot, uh, and fit right in. I had a red polo on like uh, everyone else <laughs> there, and yeah. I just watched everyone, and, and you know, within ten minutes was a yacht polo club person. Absolutely, and I, and I think like a more um, measurable example, or maybe I don't know how measurable this is, but like accents like when I I'm from North Carolina and when mm -hmm. I go down south <laughs> I pick up my my home the accent twang. a lot more um, but when I'm here at Haverford I you know I speak Brusque, similarly Northeastern. yeah exactly yeah it's funny <laughs> yeah uh, I've seen that with other people almost to an annoying, annoying extent so <laughs> like uh, your friends uh, come back from England and they have like a Cockney accent or yep, something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and but then another one. I just I watched uh, American Psycho uh, a couple of weekends ago, yeah. and uh, like ha the main character in that describing how he observes everyone to fit in. Uh, it's an old movie uh, with Christian Bale. Uh, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he he is very um, like a structured. He he has like a understand like a explicit understanding of trying how to he imitate. Does it. Yeah. Yeah. Other people. Which is really uh, cool. Yeah, and not something that uh, everyone is thinking about in terms of how they're, who they are, and then who they try to pr pr uh, project. Project, yeah, right. Uh, and uh, so you uh, mentioned uh, your BuzzFeed article, I have to say the name of it, 10 Facts That You uh, Don't Know About Learning in the Brains. Number five will literally make your head explode. Mm -hmm. uh, subtitle, seriously, don't read number five, your head will literally explode. <laughs> uh, 
uh, when I first read that, I started laughing in my office. I think people around me thought I was crazy. Uh, <laughs> but what have other people thought about uh, your article? Well, I thought, um, so I, some of my friends came across it because um, just like through Twitter, and um, they they were surprised. They, they um, the, I think the title is a fun, just like clickbait uh, title, which yeah. I had a good time. I, I thought um, I wanted to add a little bit of humor and make mm -hmm. it um, just more appealing to like your whoever would come across Cover, it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's been the reaction. I, I tried to pick like images that were mm -hmm. fun. I picked a Planet of the Apes, yeah. just like a monkey with a little snarl holding a shotgun, um, which with, with the with the title with the uh, subtitle, this is getting confusing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that my, the reaction that, that I've seen, which is like minor, up, um, but I, it, it's been positive and, and it was a fun article mm -hmm. to write. I think it's been a fun fun one to read. I hope. Yeah, it was kind of like a. A sneaky way to make have make people learn things, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in particular, like uh, the last two points, uh, taking a break to help uh, people learn, and uh, that being in a good mood uh, can uh, put you in a, a better way place to remember things. Right, which I learned in your class. Yeah. 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 yeah so uh, I think uh, trying trying to translate something that can be very confusing, so the self, memory, differences between humans and other animals. Having uh, making it entertaining, uh, using things like monkeys. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and, and like the funny pictures. I think I've noticed since I've been learning more about this that <laughs> like when I see like a fun infographic that has like you know silly aspects, yeah. it makes it makes it easier for me to like get like jump in and like have a good time reading it. I don't even realize that I have read the whole article. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think uh, going forward that there's any new or developing areas of research that uh, you're particularly interested in? Yeah, um, definitely. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, um, I guess, how to define some terms, like how to define the mind as opposed to the brain, and oh, okay. um, which is, I guess, like a big thing. And, yeah. and uh, I guess I don't know if you you can separate the two. Um, but yeah, I don't know, that's a really interesting. I'm, I'm interested to see how much neuroscience has to say about the difference there and, and what the mind consists of. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of the one of the unanswered questions of, of neuroscience, and it's something yeah. that basically people wait their entire career to do. Uh, so, like uh, a big person, uh, Antonio Damasio, mm -hmm. uh, kind of did his career, built his career on uh, decision making and emotion, and now he's trying to explore consciousness. Uh, well, in particular, he was looking at like uh, brain damage. What happens when you just like yank a, a part of someone's brain out? Does that change who they are fundamentally? Right. Uh, so like, what do, what is that connection between mind and self? Yeah, and like personality. Personality. Self. Yeah. And the brain. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because um, uh, he was looking at a, a patient group where they received damage to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and uh, he called the behavioral effects of that afterwards acquired sociopathy. Mm. Uh, so wow. here you could like make psych uh, sociopaths or psychopaths damaging a, one part of the brain. Wow, yeah, that's that's crazy. I think, yeah, it's really interesting to see like what, um, I mean, I guess lesion studies would be a really good way to figure out um, what parts of the brain are fundamental to or necessary um, for. A conception of self, or or even just like the existence of a self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, one I was mentioning earlier, uh, where the um, kind of memory centers were removed uh, in this individual, and he still had like this idea identity of who he was. You know, I'm this person. I like these things. I grew up in this place. Wow. Uh, so like, how much can we remove from like someone's past and uh, you know, and change them in different ways, and they still have this core essence of who they are. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting because memory is something that doesn't seem like a. Um, it seems very connected to self and not necessarily like a, a functional part of the brain where, where we do things mm -hmm. um, actively. And it, I don't know, it's it seems to me like it's more closely related to personality and and the mind than mm -hmm. like the functions of the brain, like making the body work. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I think memory is really going to be a, a key part of my research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think having uh, some of this background in neuroscience now is changing how you're approaching uh, your philosophy topics, like philosophy of the mind? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think in class, I just have a slightly different view. I feel um, a little more confident in what I say about the brain, I think, um, and the mind, I think my my research and my papers that I write in philosophy now, I, I'm doing less just kind of guessing about mm -hmm. functions and and, um, and that's really propelled my ability to um, uh, just be confident when I talk about, you know, what humans are capable of yeah. with their minds. Yeah, and is that class uh, up at Bryn Mawr? No, that's at Haverford. Oh, it is, okay. Danielle Macbeth. Okay, uh, interesting, because I, I was, I'm familiar with the Adrian Prettyman up at Bryn Mawr. Oh, yeah. I know she does philosophy of the mind, so. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I have never taken a class with her. Yeah. Well, interesting. So I think uh, wrapping up here, do you think that there's any kind of one really important thing that you want to mention or communicate about your research? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it would be that, like, there are, I think there must be things that make us uniquely human. Um, and I guess, I'm not prepared yet to say what those are, <laughs> yeah. but I think that's the most important part of the research for me is figuring out what those fundamental differences are. Um, I think they, they relate to language, they relate to memory, mm -hmm. and um, maybe even language more so than memory. I, I think it's, um, yeah, so, so language, memory, and like personality, I think are the three key things that I am looking at in trying to figure out what those you know, categorical differences are. Yeah. All right. Uh, so then the last question, uh, anything that uh, you'd like to promote coming up? Yeah. Um, Haverford College Ultimate Frisbee uh, is, a, is a club that I'm a part of. Um, we're a competitive Ultimate Frisbee team. You can like our Facebook page, Haverford College Ultimate. Um, we're traveling to South Carolina this weekend for Easterns, D3 Easterns, which will determine how, whether we can uh, have a chance to qualify for nationals. Wow. Well, good luck. Thank you. And uh, I will end there, so thank you for coming in. Thanks. Good. Yeah, I had a good time. So thanks so much to Calvin for coming in. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's an interesting discussion, and I think one that should be had more often, uh, where we go across disciplines, uh, being able to speak uh, with philosophers about neuroscience, uh, neuroscience uh, to philosophers uh, and a number of other groups uh, so being able to have that conversation was great uh, looking to the last two uh, segments of the show uh, I, I'm not going to do Jake's jams today uh, because as I said in the previous uh, episode uh, I'm kind of running out of things to talk about uh, things I'm interested in uh, so I'm going to bring up scholar notifications and uh, self-indulge with uh, two notifications from my own work uh, I think since they connect uh, somewhat to the uh, discussion today uh, so one of them being uh, a new method for assessing the impact of the medial temporal lobe's amnesia on the characteristics of generated autobiographical events. Uh, this was a work with uh, Ariel Lenton Brem, myself, uh, Shana Rosenbaum, and Signe Sheldon. Uh, and uh, here we are looking at uh, the ability of individuals with uh, MTL amnesia to generate uh, events and then describe those events in uh, further uh, detail. Uh, and so after they uh, we created these event constructions from the events that they were talking about. Uh, we sent them out to over 450 online writers using MTurk uh, to rate them for a number of different qualitative dimensions uh, that seem to vary with autobiographical recall, things like frequency, significance, emotionality, imaginability, and uniqueness. And what we critically found was uh, that the MTL amnesia were more prone to select events that were rated as free occurring more frequently uh, than healthy control uh, participants. Uh, so uh, already when they're just choosing an event uh, to then narrate in further detail, they seem to be uh, talking about some things that uh, they're more used to happening. They're less unique uh, and kind of special events. Uh, so they seem to be re relying more heavily on semantic memory processes uh, and selecting these kind of generalized events. Uh, and so I think that's really interesting how um, oftentimes we've been looking at uh, the production of these narratives or these memories uh, you know, after they've selected them. But here we're showing that in the process of selecting them, they seem to be doing something a little bit differently uh, and how in interesting that is. Uh, and so that was uh, with uh, undergraduate researcher Ariel Linton-Brim as the uh, 
the first author, uh, and under uh, Signe Sheldon uh, as her, I think her first uh, senior author paper uh, as she started up her lab up at McGill. Uh, and uh, now turning over to uh, another paper. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And in this um, new a novel, new method for assessing the impact of medial temporal lobe amnesia on the characteristics of generated autobiographical events. Uh, that was in Neuropsychologia, uh, 2016. Turning over to uh, another paper again, self-indulging. Uh, I'm talking about a new paper uh, with uh, Dave Warren and uh, my uh, graduate mentor Melissa Duff. Uh, what relates newspaper? definite and clothing an article describing the deficits and convergent problem solving and creativity following hippocampal damage uh, which is currently an accepted article at hippocampus and uh, it will soon be published uh, as an edited article uh, fairly soon uh, but uh, this was a follow-up to a, a study a couple of years ago where we looked at uh, the torrance test of creativity in individuals with amnesia and showed a, a significant deficit in their creative thinking uh, and as here, instead of relying on divergent thinking or how that test was a test of divergent thinking, trying to create as many uh, possibilities uh, from something like uh, how would you make use of strings hanging down from clouds or how many thing uses of, for a cardboard box can you think of, this test went the other direction and looked at convergent thinking. Uh, and so uh, creativity seems to rely on this diverse set of processes, both convergent and divergent thinking. Uh, and uh, so we were trying to look at uh, convergent uh, problem solving uh, where uh, we gave uh, individuals these triads like newspaper, definite, and clothing, uh, and uh, they had to come up with the word that tied all three of those together, uh, something like article. And uh, here we found that uh, the participants with hippocampal amnesia uh, were, uh, again, uh, producing significantly fewer correct responses than their healthy comparison group, uh, indicating that the hippocampus is necessary for normal convergent problem solving. Uh, and that uh, uh, <coughs> affects their uh, creative thinking, uh, in particular across short intervals. Uh, and so uh, that was nice uh, to see the uh, problem both in convergent and divergent thinking. Uh, and so now with uh, two articles on creativity, I, I consider myself a minor uh, creativity researcher. Uh, and so that paper, again, was uh, rapid communication in the journal Hippocampus. The, uh, it's accepted currently, uh, and there's an unedited version up on uh, the website, uh, there should be an edited version coming up soon, uh, but that was uh, with the senior author, uh, David Warren, who's just started up his lab uh, out in uh, Omaha, and uh, myself and uh, my uh, graduate advisor, Melissa Duff, uh, what relates newspaper definite and clothing, an article describing uh, deficits in convergent problem solving and creativity following hippocampal damage. Uh, and so then turning to the last part of the show, uh, reader mail, Twitter tweets, uh, still nothing, uh, but you can reach me at uh, EngageBrain on Twitter, or uh, you can email me at my last name at gmail.com, and you'll be able to find, uh, or there you can uh, email me about any questions that you have that I can answer on future shows, or with any suggestions for topics that I should cover uh, in those future shows. Uh, so uh, please uh, send your tweets uh, my way, your, your emails my way, and I'd love to uh, start answering them. So this has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks for listening.